Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Ian Bruce and this is Interviews from Quito, the programme in which we explore some of the big challenges facing this country and the region. In today's programme, we take a break from the immediate political situation here in Ecuador and look at an innovative project to protect some of the most endangered species, especially sharks, in the seas north of the Galapagos Islands. It's called the Migravia, or Galapagos Cocos Swimway. And to explain this to us, we're very pleased to have with us Santiago Bucaram. He's one of the experts working on this initiative, and he's an economist specializing in natural resources based at the ESPOL Polytechnic on the Ecuadorian coast. But first, let's take a look at this short video. In August of 2017, a Chinese cargo ship was detained around the Galapagos Islands. The Asian crew was illegally fishing sharks and carrying thousands of things to export. Ecuador's government started the case and arrested the 20 crew members. Chancellor Maria Fernanda Espinosa talked about this. We've asked China to send a response about this protest regarding respect for our sovereignty, our private economic area, and also our conservation principles established in the UN's Convention about Maritime Rights. Despite the regulations regarding protected areas in the archipelago, the law is still not clear about fishing in surrounding waters or migration ways of marine animals, like sharks, which are considered endangered species. Thank you for coming in, Santiago. We saw in that video one of the threats to the shark population around the Galapagos. So let's start with the problem. How seriously endangered are these species and by what? Yeah, uh, first, thank you for the invitation, Ian. Uh, yeah, you saw one of the threats of these migratory species, these, uh, these international fleets that they come to this area and they, try, they catch uh, these migratory species. And, but actually, uh, we have to uh, specify that in, the, in that specific case, the main problem was that they were transporting the, the sharks, but they never catch the sharks inside of the Galapagos Marine Reserve, so, so as to be specific. But that doesn't mean that doesn't exist other, other boats that belong to, to other flags, for example, even chi China, Costa Rica, and other that, that they, 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 they do this illegal activity. Or sometimes it's not illegal because they, what they do is they, they, they approach very close to the border and they catch these migratory species and they, and they take advantage of the fact that they are protected in this area and they capitalize in the fact, uh, in the fact that given that it's protected, they get these species in the border when they are, these migratory species are coming out. But, but let, let, let me just get this clear. It's legal to catch these species or not? Uh, it's l as long as in international waters, it's legal. But that and that is the problem. Because you only can protect the species in your water. Outside of the water... So there, there is no international protection in international waters? There is, there is different types of regulations, but... Uh, uh, in but by international regulations, you can, you can catch that species. There's, there's no problem at all. And that is the main problem of the protected areas because you protect the species in the area, but what happened outside of the area? This is another thing. Uh, this is only one of the threats. The other threat that we have here in Ecuador is the artisanal fishery, okay? Uh, we were very shocked when we realized that this boat has 6,000, approximately 6,000 sharks. But we, sh we should know, or, or people should know, that per year, the artisanal fleet in Ecuador, they catch approximately 250,000 sharks I mean, per I, year. I read that figure in, an article, in a letter you wrote to Science magazine, mm -hmm. and it just seems an incredible number. I mean, that's almost 700 sharks a day. Exactly. Exactly, and the situation is that you have this, uh, this ministerial decree to which uh, the fishermen, they can catch these sharks and as long as this, ca the, the, this shark is a bycatch, you can, you, can, you can have it, you can, you can keep it and you can sell it. What does that mean, a bycatch? Exactly? A bycatch means that you, you didn't intend to catch shark that you, you have another, another species as a target. And this is, a, oh, this is something like, for example, you throw the, the net and, oh, 
I have a shark, and this is bycatch. This, I, I, so, so I, I, didn't, I didn't plan to catch so a shark. So you're saying that 250,000 sharks are caught by accident every year <laughs> in Ecuador? Yeah, exactly. And the, and the problem is that who decides, what, who decides that this shark is a bycatch or not? The, the law is very, is very ambiguous. And right now, actually, because the law never says who decides, who decides who is a bycatcher, uh, if the shark is a bycatcher or not, is the same fisherman. The fisherman say, you know, I catch this dolphin fish, I catch this tuna, and this shark that was bycatch. Oh, it was bycatch? Yes, it was bycatch. Okay, you can sell it. Yeah, the same fisherman decides if it's a bycatch, they label as a bycatch, and they can, com they can sell this, this shark, because in that moment, is immediately legal. And, now, and, and de facto, we are allowing to catch sharks because of this ministerial decree. Um, that, is a, that is a big problem because there is a big problem. It's a problem of 250,000 sharks that are caught per, per year um, that make you, th make you think maybe, maybe it's not a bycatch uh, fishery, it's a target fishery. Because if you can decide, if, if you as a fisherman can put a label that this is bycatch and you, um, because you put the, the label, you can sell it, yeah, I, 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 you, all the incentives are distorted to catch sharks that are very valuable in different markets. For I example, say, so, so what is the incentive? I mean, who are they selling these sharks to? They're, they are selling these sharks to, to Asia, but also they are selling to Peru. They are evidence, according to the Daniel Pauli, that there's evidence. Daniel Pauli is a very important uh, uh, marine economist uh, in the world, and that these sharks are sold to Peru. Um, but that, that is not the main problem. The for main the problem... Peru, for, for the Peruvian market? Yeah, for the Peruvian market. To, to, to eat? Or what? Yeah, to eat. Actually, actually they, uh, according, to, according to anecdotal evidence, uh, the fisherman says that the the fin, you take all the fins and you sell you you sold the fins to Asia market, but the body, the body goes to Peru. Um, they use the the meat of the body uh, for different Peruvian uh, Peruvian uh, dishes and things like that. So rich. Exactly, <laughs> but but the problem is again it's a problem of incentive. You have this ministerial decree, four hundred eighty six that distort the incentive of the fishermen and, and how distorted making this fishery th that should be illegal based on all the, all the agreements that we have signed because in the world the sharks and these other migratory species are in danger, endangered species and we, should, we must protect these species but now the, with this decree we are changing the incentive of the fishermen, and the fishermen right now, they are behaving as this species uh, would be something like a target species. And that is, that is a reality. It's a reality. That number came from a paper that was published in Plus One Journal uh, we, that was written by Jimmy Martinez and people from the IATTC. Um, and it's evidence that right now in Ecuador, we are catching sharks as a target fishery. And actually, actually, two weeks ago, a, a, a boat was, was a detained inside of, uh, a long liner boat was detained entering to the Galapagos Marine Reserve catching sharks. And I think that one month ago, two, one and a half months ago, there was also other problem with other boats entering to the Galapagos Marine Reserve. It, Galapagos Marine Reserve catching sharks. Therefore, apparently, this is something that is, is a systematic problem. Are, are we talking about sharks in general, specific species of shark, or, or what? Sharks in general. All, all, the, all these migratory, all these sharks, has a, the, because of the life cycle, a, a, the, a, when they are when the, when they face this fishing effort, because of their life cycle, they they cannot regenerate a, fast enough. So as to so as to preserve the 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 normal or the healthy abundance that is necessary for a sustainable uh, existence, uh, 
may, may, uh, mainly because they are they are big they are big fishes for saying something they are big and because if they are big they need uh, a, a, a longer time to recovery to to, to growth and to uh, the life cycle is very slow and because of that uh, when you when you allocate fishing effort so as to catch this specific species you are affecting this species but only in the some long of term. those species are endangered correct uh, yeah some of them are in danger some of them are in danger but I, but most of them most of the shark some of them are in danger and the other are about to be in danger and that is that is the situation is something is because of the precautionary precautionary principle that it, that should be applied in, in when you manage natural resources you should establish a special conservation measures so as to avoid any in the future um, that is something that is not that hasn't been done in Ecuador. We are, we, we, all the people who work in these type of of topics or this type of of, of projects, like trying to con in conservation of marine resources, we are very, very optimistic that a new fishery law in Ecuador is going to change that. Is going to define what is what what bycatch really means when you are talking about sharks. And also, that is going to change, change that uh, that what that decree, the administrative decree, says about about uh, how to deal with this bycatch. We're very optimistic about that. That that is going to change. There's also other problems. I, I want to come on to that later, but let's let's move on to your project itself, which, as I understand it, is a, is a proposal at the moment. It's not operating. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So just explain to us what the proposal is, how it would work. Yeah, the origin of this idea came from from other project that was a, a transboundary or international project that uh, begins on 2001 and finished on 2004 with this with something that is called the San Jose Agreement, in which a uh, in which it was established something that was called the Eastern Tropical Pacific Seascape, that was uh, that was like a, a special area of conservation that uh, that co that is is bounded by these different islands or different island different islands in Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica and Ecuador. In Ecuador we have Galapagos in Panama, uh, we have uh, Coiba in Colombia is Malpelo and Gorgona and in Costa Rica is Cocos. Then you have that big area. But then it was a little complicated to try to to try to implement that that big seascape uh, area um, there was there was this idea from um, from an institution that was that was founded by different environmental funds from all these countries Colombia Panama um, Costa Rica and Ecuador uh, that, that is called a Pacific ne Network of Red Pacifico in which they say okay why don't we try instead of making this big area why don't we try to make areas uh, try to make these protected areas in the with the adjacent uh, the islands. For example, they are trying to make some. Or they they already are in a in a in a very uh, very late stages of uh, establishing a swingway. That, that 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 is how they call it. Something like a freeway, mm -hmm. but it's a swingway. Uh, it is a is a is a is a is a, is a area in which these migratory species can swing without any any threat threat that came from the fishing effort you're talking about the galapagos cocos yeah. swimwear this is a yeah the galapagos a, like cocos a channel swimwear. if you like yeah but yeah. they they first the, the right now is is in first stages between galapagos and cocos and now it's in the in later stages between malpelo and coiba and what they are doing is, instead of having this big area, is separating the areas and establishing s different swingways. The swingway that I'm, partici I'm participating as an expert to try to design how to implement this, this idea is between Galapagos and Cocos. Uh, the characteristic is that the Galapagos and Cocos are interconnected by something that is called the Cocos Ridge. That is a series of underwater mountains that connect these two areas, and this is a very productive area for these migratory species. Uh, that when I talk about migratory species, I'm talking about sharks, I'm talking about whale sharks, I'm talking about rays and turtles. Um, what what the idea is 
is to try to not protect only the species inside the protected areas, but also out of the boundaries of the protected areas in, the, in, in, in specific areas in which the, scientif the scientist has determined that the, these uh, species uh, migrate or move between these two islands. So selecting the areas where the work would have the greatest impact. Exactly. And right now, right now there is a lot of work that, that, so, uh, that these scientists are doing and also social scientists we are doing. For example, the, the, these, bi these scientists from the biological point of view, they are trying to determine where this polygon should be. Where, where should be the best place to put this, this rectangle, for example, between Cocos and Galapagos? What is the best place to put it? What is the best, the best width for the polygon? All that, all that uh, specifications, they are trying to think what is the best, the optimal thing. Okay, so once you define the area, <laughs> yeah. then what do you do? I mean, how do you protect them okay. outside? Now that you define the area, the next step is, how, what do we do with that area? We can... There are different ideas, okay, but this uh, this idea should should uh, these ideas are necessary that they be or they they produce biological benefits. That means that the the species should be protected. That is the main the main objective, but also that is that the economic the economic impact should be a uh, minimal. Okay, you don't want you don't want to affect the people who who depend on fisheries too much, because then you have the third part. You need that this this area or this new poli uh, conservation policy should be political feasible. That means that uh, is something that is going to last for many years, um, um, because if you ha you produce something that is, for example, a no take zone, okay, a lot of a lot of fishermen are going to be affected not only artisanal, but also industrial fisher fishermen, that they have some level of political power. And what they are going to do is to, is to, is to make the idea to, to fail, because they are going to put pressure to, to get rid of that swing weight. Okay, and so what do you do? If you don't just prohibit the exactly. fishing, what do you do? That is, what, that is the uh, specific uh, work that we are doing right now. What is the best option that we can apply? We have, uh, we have a menu of different ideas. For example, no take song is one, it's the, it's, the, it's the extreme, and we know that it's not political feasible. The other one is a MPA with, with a marine protected area uh, with, different, with different uses. That means a marine protected area in which you can fish but you can fish under specific permits and under uh, very strict regulations. Or you can have something that is called an area, uh, uh, area with a special uh, conservation measures. That is something that already exists in the ocean. For example, you have the Galapagos, and west of the Galapagos, there's something that is called the El Corralito. This area that is called El Corralito is a, is, is a, is a ocean area with, with, a specific, with a special conservation measures. Uh, this Coralito has a, close, a special closure date and, and also they are think, the IITTC thinking to put additional uh, conservation measures. But you already have in the, in the Pacific Ocean this area that has a special conservation measures. Maybe the best idea for this swingway should be to implement an area with a special conservation measures in which you say in this area you have closures, you have even, even a quota for the amount of, 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 uh, the amount of uh, catch that you can have or even a quota of the time that you can be there uh, or either you can have a special conservation measures about the fishing years and things like that. We think um, at this moment that maybe that is the best way to follow. That is the best path that we can we can go. But so, so, so who benefits from this? I mean, apart from the sharks. Yeah, uh, everybody, everybody benefits. Um, for All example, right. uh, I have a paper. I have a paper that I did from the Galapagos Islands. This paper was published in Marine Policy just two months ago, in which I analyzed the impact of the Galapagos Marine Reserve on the level of productivity. Uh, uh, productivity in this case would be defined in the amount of catch that is that you get from one set that a boat, uh, a tuna boat 
uh, make in a specific uh, moment. Uh, how much catch you, you get when you broaden it, okay? We found that after the Galapagos Marine Reserve was established, the productivity increased almost 100%. Why? Because you have, you protect this area. Let's say that you protect, you protect this Galapagos Marine Reserve, you protect this area, something like this, something like this square. And then what happened is that this, this works something like a, first making a, a, maybe a silly analogy, it's like, like a saving account, okay? This area has various, very specific or very special characteristics. For example, this area, this Galapagos Marine Reserve, you have, uh, you have a ma there's, there's evidence that you have a special recruitment here. The, uh, the, the tuna reproduce, uh, they like to go there to reproduce, things like that, okay? Therefore, because you protect this area, the tuna, the tuna, the tuna, the tuna fleet, they cannot enter to the area. Yeah, they lost because they cannot enter. But when you analyze the productivity in the borders, that means you very mean, close. You mean because in this area, the tuna or whatever it is reproduced, there are more more tuna, so there are actually more tuna outside as well. Exactly. And now you capitalize the benefit of uh, the tuna sector that that now they cannot enter to the, to the Galapagos Marine Reserve, they capitalize that conservation measure in the borders. And it's a win-win situation. And I proved with that paper, and actually there was, a, there was a paper one month later from other authors that they, they do something very similar to me, that they, they get the same results. That means something that is very, very, very important is that the Marine Reserve, even though in the first year the industrial sector is affected because they cannot enter to this fishing area that was a, 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 fishing, a historical fishing area. They are going to be benefit in the long term because now the productivity is even higher. And now even the fishermen that are, that are, that are prohibited to enter to fish, they, they get a benefit. And that is the situation. It's not only, it's not only the, the migratory species, it's also it's all that benefit, but it's also the fishermen because now you have a, 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 an area in which the target species, the ones that you want to catch, because we assume that sharks are bycatch, but the ones that you want to catch are going to be more protected and outside of that, the productivity is going to be higher. And then um, that is proved scientifically. Then this is a very good idea. We know, and um, we know this by by experience, that if in the first years the, the sector is going to be against this type of ideas. But as the... Because it involves a, a loss in the short term? Yeah, but as the years goes further, the sector realized that was a very good idea. You, if you, there, there's, there's a study from WWF in which the tuna sector in Ecuador, they, say, they said that right now, one of the best ideas that was implemented was the Galapagos Marine Reserve. There's even some tuna, some tuna, a, a, some representative of the tuna sector that they want a, a amplify the Galapagos Marine Reserve because they know this effect of the increase of the productivity. And actually, that is something that they know. For that reason, the, the same tuna sector, they create this corralito that is in the west of the Galapagos Marine Reserve. There is a protected area, but it's a seasonal protected area. During a season, it's a no-take zone. They benefit from that area because they think, uh, or there's evidence that, that the tuna reproduce in that area, and they agree to not fish there for, for several weeks. And then after that, uh, they, they capitalize the benefits with more productivity. Before we run out of time, Santiago, I wanted to broaden it out a little bit because even if you resolve the problem of fishing, the predatory fishing uh, on these species around the Galapagos. Are there not a, a number of other even more serious threats to the, to the species and to the Galapagos as an ecosystem? I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, warming oceans, yeah. acidification of the oceans, yeah, exactly. uh, plastic in the oceans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for example, yeah, this is only one threat. The, fish, the fishing is only one threat. We should not say that it's the only threat. And in some level and right now in this moment maybe in some locations is not the most important threat 
there are more important threats, for example, the, the climate change. Uh, there's a lot of evidence in which uh, we have that, okay, climate change is real, <laughs> you don't have to dispute that. The ocean is getting warmer, but it's getting wor it's, it's m the impact is more in the tropical, in the tropic, than in the, in, the, in the places up and down the tropic. And because this belt is getting very hot, all the species are migrating to the north or to the south. And that is going to impact to all this fleet. And the fleet, are go and this artisanal fleet, especially artisanal fleet, they are going to be very frustrated, very desperate, and they are going to be more predatory, and that is something that you, you should realize. So the two things interact. Yeah, exactly. The fishing and the climate yeah. change. Because imagine that you go, you go to a place in which you know that, these, that you can, are going to find tuna, but suddenly, year by year, the tuna is going down, and not because there is a lot of uh, fishing effort, but because of climate change. It's because the, the tuna is going up, up uh, to the north or down to the south, and they cannot do anything, and they are going to, to use a fi a fishing techniques that are more predatory than initially. The other are the contamination, acidification, and also the plastic. There are a lot of threats. The fishing is only one, and it's the one that can be solved very easy because the only thing that you have to do is to establish policies that align the incentive of the fisherman to the conservation, but at the same time, you protect the quality of life of these people. Because that is something that is very important. For example, when, 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 when these, biology, or these policies, these marine policies are designed only by biologists, uh, I'm going to be killed because of this, but, but it's not a good idea. Because the biologists, they try to manage the species. But actually, when you are managing fisheries, you are trying to manage a, the fishermen, the human being. And you, ha you can use economics to change their incentive. And, and so, as to, so as to make a fishery sustainable, one component that is very important is that the fishery can produce economic benefits. That is something that you should, you should consider. For the reason I know take some, for example, it's not always a good idea. Because what is going to happen is that you are going to affect negatively the, 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 the wealth of these fishermen. And the fishermen are not going to stay, to stay, okay, now I cannot fish and now I'm poor, I'm not going to do anything. No, they're going to break the law. So and actually it doesn't work. Exactly, exactly. Mm. It doesn't work and make the things worse. We know for different, in different cases, not only in fisheries, but in different situations, for example, even in drugs, that prohibition is not a good idea. Prohibition, command and control actually produce results that are different to the, what you expect or what you plan. For that reason, what we want to do is pol a policy that consider the health of the of the species, but also the health of the of the economy of these fishermen. That's a very clear point. I think we're going to have to end there because we're out of time, Santiago. But thank you so much. Uh, it's a fascinating, and, and we'll certainly follow and, and be looking at how that project develops. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been talking to Santiago Bucaram about the Galapagos Cocos Swimway project to protect uh, endangered species around the Galapagos. I'm Ian Bruce. You've been watching interviews from Quito. Until next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>